tonight, what are we doing? Performance objectives. We always start off with the performance objectives for those of you that don't know. And tonight we're going to be talking about major breaches, new or novel attacks, and then events of interest. And there's been a whole bunch of stuff that happened in 2017. I have a pretty good list, but I'm going to tell you right now, it's incomplete. Your favorite hack or the thing that you're responsible for might not be on this list. And if it's not, I'm sorry. But if you uh, go on the Chandler PD webpage and you file a report about yourself and send it to us, we'll definitely look into it for you. So thank you. So the first major event that I want to get into that's super, super important is swatting. Because we finally had our first death. We had a gentleman in Kansas who was killed by an officer who responded to his home under the impression that there was a extreme emergency in the home. And if you have not had an opportunity to listen to the tape, Kansas was real good about immediately releasing the 911 call that spurred them to respond and end that man's life. Okay, And he had nothing to do with what was going on. He was just a guy in his house. The house got surrounded by SWAT team members and other members of law enforcement. He comes out to figure out what's going on, and they shoot him. Okay, and you can see it. They've got the video online. They've released the video. They have released the tapes. You can hear everything. You can see everything. They've been very, very vocal about what's going on. And this is a really big deal because for years and years and years, people like me who work in law enforcement have been saying over and over, somebody is going to die. If you keep calling SWAT teams and you keep calling law enforcement and sending them out, eventually somebody's going to make a mistake and it's going to end in a tragedy. Well, it did. Okay, so if you were following along and you were to open this up, the link takes you to information. And this actually does contain uh, links to, and I picked this link because it had links to the audio so you can actually listen to what happened. It gives you an explanation. They have some pictures uh, here for you to follow along and so on and so forth. But uh, there was a gentleman in California who went by Swatistic. Okay, his last name was Barris. And this guy is well known, uh, essentially everywhere, for doing swatting calls, bomb threats. He's been arrested before. He has a pretty long rap sheet. And he's really into Call of Duty. That's his thing. Um, he's done over 100 school threats. He's done 10 residence threats. Uh, he's been previously convicted for calling in a bomb threat that shut down an ABC affiliate. If you want to know what ABC affiliate was, it's real easy. Look up this guy's name and the words ABC on your search engine of choice. You will be able to find fairly quickly who this guy is and what he was doing. And what essentially happened here is two guys got in an argument over a dollar and fifty cent wager on a game of Call of Duty. They butted heads about it. One of them went to Swatistic and requested, hey, I want you to swat this guy. Swatistic said, okay, reaches out to the other guy, says, what's your address? The guy, knowing who Swatistic is, decides not to give him a legitimate address, taunts him, and then provides him the address of a man who lives down the street who does not play video games. He's a single father, has two kids, works several jobs, so on and so forth. If you read the whole story about this guy, it's pretty tragic. Uh, he didn't play video games, anything like that. So Swatistic, not checking any of this information, picks up the phone, dials, and you can listen to the thing, talks about how uh, he has a gun, he's killed his mom, he's killed his dad, he's killed all these different people, he's holding the whole family hostage, and when the cops get there, he's going to kill them too. Police roll up. Uh, apparently, they're not. There seems to be some failures here, and the lawyers that are involved in this have already made some pretty large claims. Uh, you can see their videos online if you're interested in doing that. The lawyers are online. A whole bunch of people are all online. And then we're also going to go over how to actually pull all the court records here in a minute. So if you want to actually read your court records, you'll be able to do that too. Uh, but it costs money. It's like $1.50 for California, and I think it's like $2 for Kansas. And I wasn't willing to pay that money. Sorry, guys. I love you all, but you can look it up yourself. I'll send you the links, OK? Um, so law enforcement shows up. Uh, and as soon as they do, at some point, the gentleman comes to the door, opens the door, his hands go down, and the officer is claiming that he felt that that gentleman was reaching for a weapon at the waistband and fires, I believe, one shot, kills him almost instantly. And after that, that's where this becomes a huge news thing, because this is our first confirmed swatting death. 
uh, and it happened in 2017. Now, I just told you all that we would figure out where to go for all of this information, right? So the first thing that I did was, and this is important because how many of you actually came to my class where I talked about intelligence gathering and open source intelligence? A couple of two hands, okay. So we had a course on open source intelligence that we did in here about how to look people up, how to find things. We had a discussion about how 4chan got a bunch of guys from ISIS blown up and killed, how they exactly, you know, a breakdown of who they communicated and where they went and everything that required for them to be able to call in an airstrike. It was a pretty interesting class. You should go watch the video. It's two hours worth of really, really, really good information. So working off of that, the first thing I did was I took this guy's name and I went and plugged it into the court system in LA because they said he was arrested in where? California. So if you go here to the criminal case summary uh, on Los Angeles court, you can actually search by names, you can search by different information here. First thing I did was I went in there, plugged in all of his information, and I got his case number. So his case number for his extradition hearing is BA464000. With that information, uh, you can then actually go in and pull all of the court records, but then, like I said, it costs money. You gotta give them a credit card. And once you give them that credit card and you pay for it, <coughs> excuse me, I've been sick since November. Uh, once you pay that, then you'll have access to all of the court records and you can actually see what's going on inside of the court, if you were interested in doing so. Uh, and I'm sorry, I, I think I said it was like $2. Actually, in California, they've raised the price to almost five bucks. So bank breaking. Uh, Kansas is actually like the $2 and something. Uh, in addition to that, if you were interested in looking this stuff up and continuing with that, PACER, which is the Public Access to Court Electronic Records, that is a, a great place. Again, they charge money. You register, and then for every court case that you want to pull up, it, it's going to cost you X amount of dollars, and then you can pull all of the information from the court case. All of this stuff is public records, and it's available to the public. It's all made available to you, but for some of it, it does cost money. Uh, from there, I was able to find out the date of his extradition proceeding hearing, which is on 2-2-2018. Uh, and then from there, once he is extradited, then the Kansas courts are going to take over. And if you were to continue to follow this case through, you would have to go pull the information from the Kansas courts, which, again, we have a link right here. For the Office of Judicial Administration for the Kansas District Courts. And they have breakdowns of, you know, right here. On November 1st, 2017, they're raising their price for records from $1 to $1.50. So. so what did we find out? Well, he's being charged with manslaughter, which is sort of the important item on there right now. They're claiming that uh, what he did makes him in part responsible for this man's death. Uh, in addition to that, um, as soon as this went down, the community at large had pretty much already identified who did it before law enforcement really ever even gotten involved. Uh, as soon as this gentleman had been shot and it showed up in the news that he had passed away, uh, a bounty was put out on Swatistic's head of approximately $5,000. Somebody jumped on Twitter and said, I'll pay $5,000 to the first guy who breaks into his Twitter account and gives up who he is. You give me actionable intelligence on this guy and you get five grand. And this was a the gentleman who put out that bounty on this guy was a former swatter slash guy who was trying to get his life straight. Um, he had he'd been one of the guys who called SWAT on. Does everybody here know who Brian Krebs is? No? Krebs on security? So Krebs on security and Brian Krebs, uh, he's kind of well known for being a pincushion slash target for a whole bunch of people. There's been Russian hackers and U.S. hackers and guys from Britain and tons and tons of people who have been really, really pissed off at Brian Krebs and they've had his internet shut down. They turned off the water to his house. They've swatted his home multiple times. They've gone after this guy, just really ran his life into the dirt. Um, but he constantly just, you know, gets on there and reports on these guys and does stuff that pisses them off and they come right back out and keep going after him. Well, once that bounty went out, Swatistic actually went to Brian Krebs and said, I just want to make it clear to the record 
that I'm not responsible for shooting this guy because I'm not a police officer, so I don't have a gun, so I didn't shoot him. And after making his declaration that it wasn't his fault, uh, he then went on Twitter and started telling everybody and getting in arguments that it wasn't his fault. And a whole bunch of people dogpiled on him. And he essentially spent a couple of days telling everybody that, yeah, he made the phone call. Yeah, he was involved in the swatting incident. Yeah, he did all of these things. And then at the very end, I guess somebody reached out to Twitter and finally told him, hey, you need to shut this thing down, like take his account away. So they shut down his account. Um, Brian Krebs actually gave him an opportunity to talk to law enforcement, told him, hey, if you want, I'll put something together so you can turn yourself in. And he declined, said that they got to catch him first, which he'd already said who it was. He, uh, he was living in a group home uh, because of the fact that he had already been involved in a previous bomb threat, he'd been previously arrested, his record is there, so on and so forth. So um, they knew who he was almost instantaneously. I mean, it was within moments before they were filing paperwork to go get this guy picked up, taken in, and starting the extradition uh, process. Um, on this, I think this is sort of an example of things to come. Shortly after this happened, somebody ran a news article, which I was unable to archive before they removed it, about a woman who called in a swatting incident on an estranged husband, and they were claiming that he had been shot. And I read the whole article at this news agency, and I thought, ooh, this is very interesting. I think I need to archive this when I'm not on my cell phone. And uh, I didn't in time. So that was either a false report that was made by somebody some kind of false news article and or it actually happened and they're trying not to talk about it because this is sort of an example of what happens and some people see this not as a warning but as a positive thing hey we're getting to the point where actually we're finally getting people killed and um, I think that there's gonna be a lot of you're gonna have just as many people who put their hands up and say you know what I'm gonna back away from this as you are people who are gonna look at this and go now I know what I need to do to somebody that I don't like. Where that's going to take us in the future, I don't know. Um, but it's been going on for a while. It's going to continue to go on. And in addition to that, this whole thing right here is also kind of linked in with one of our next things that we're going to talk about with the eSports. So we're going to get to eSports in a minute, but this is all part of that. This is that sort of eSports culture that you have, if you will. Does anybody have any questions about this? You have the state to state where the federal charges. They have not stated anything about that, and I think part of this has to do with the fact that um, they are they wanted to snatch this guy, get him in custody, and get him to Kansas. And then I think that there's going to be more stuff that comes out on this. I think that the the most important part was to get the extradition hearing get this guy arrested and get him off the street. And then in addition to that, I mean, when you're a law enforcement officer and you have people putting out a bounty on somebody's head saying, get me this guy's home address, at that point, I think that they were, let's, let's get in there and, and grab this guy as quick as we can. If not just because of the case, but also maybe to, to put hands on this guy to protect him from the people who are coming for him. Uh, I don't really have to say this, but people were pissed. There was some upset people that uh, have some, some pull, I guess, would be a good word to use. There was some pretty upset people out on Twitter who have some pretty high levels of pull who were hunting this guy down like almost instantaneously. So that's where I think that's going. For all of our law enforcement folks, let's see if we can get this up. Does anybody remember the Florida hot cop? Sexiest cop in the world from Florida? No? OK. Looking at the audience, I'm not going to be like surprised. So this is more of a law enforcement thing. And I, I bring this up because we do this for law enforcement, and I do these talks for cops. And this is very, very important for anybody who's involved in law enforcement. So. A gentleman who was responding to the hurricanes, he was a, an officer, uh, he took some selfies and he ends up on Facebook 
and a whole bunch of people are like, man, this guy's the sexiest cop in the world. I didn't think he was that hot, but, you know, whatever. Everybody liked him, so that's fine. That's okay. I'm not jealous or anything. Uh, so he gets up there, and he just he jumps on it. Uh, they're adding him on Facebook. He's on Twitter. He's schmoozing. You know, they're putting him in the news. There's all kinds of images taken of this guy. It's a big deal. I mean, it's all over the place. And of course, everybody's talking about it because, oh, it's the hottest cop in the world. Ooh, who could this possibly be, right? So what do you think this guy was doing with all of his social media? Anybody want to take a guess? Yeah, because you're already reading it up there, right? Everybody see the, the text up there? What was this guy doing? This moron was out on his social media making jokes about Jewish people, writing that stupid people should be put in the oven, and talking about all the people that he would love to deal with the Hitler way. His messages were out of line, ridiculous, and guess how old they were? They were from like 2012, okay? So I, he, I don't think he was even an officer. I don't even think he was over 18 back in 2012, okay, this guy? But the, the, the takeaway here is every single thing, and this is sort of talking to law enforcement in particular, every single thing that you do, it doesn't go away, okay? Many of us are in that age group in this room where we could do stupid stuff on the internet when we were younger, and it's kind of faded away because it was on like a GeoCities webpage. Like we made that GeoCities webpage and it had all the gifts with Goku, and he was shooting fireballs and stuff, right? And it was okay because eventually GeoCities died. Today, we don't really have that. You have a perpetual history of every action you take from the moment you get on Facebook and Twitter and your social media for the rest of your life. And that, that follows you. Anybody ever try to shut down a Facebook account here? You cannot. They don't delete it. It doesn't go away. You can go in there and you can say, shut me down. And they say, OK. Well, plus they, they have like something in the user agreement where anything you post up there is their property. Correct. For the rest of your, the eternity that Facebook is a company. Which is why people uh, who take holidays into like Southeast Asia will sometimes find images from their Facebook of their family being used for advertisements over there. Uh, if you ever get bored, you can look that up, Facebook family used for advertisements on Google, and you will find that other countries will buy images from idyllic families here in the U.S. and other where, and then use those there for their stuff, like advertising sales or putting a, an advertisement for medicine or all kinds of different things, things that you maybe don't want your small child being used for, that's happening and you have no say in it because they've already sold your information. So yes, absolutely. If you look at the, the agreement, you will find very quickly that, and one of the messages for that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I guess, quote unquote, one of the families was like a British family and they went on holiday and they look up and one of their Christmas photos is being used for selling a bunch of stuff in a Korean store. So, if you're using your social media, A, you don't own it, B, you can never get rid of it, and C, it will show up again. Someday, somebody's gonna look into it. Uh, especially for those of us who try to work in like cybersecurity or anything like that, what are you gonna eventually try to go for, right? A top secret clearance? There, you're gonna be trying to do stuff where people will actually do a background check on you and they're going to look for things like that. In addition to that, again, going back to the Facebook thing, if you ever try to shut down your Facebook and then you just come back two, three years later and try to log in, it, it essentially everything comes right back up. They flip the lights back on and you have access to everything again. So just FYI. So this guy didn't know that. And what was he doing? Going around making ridiculous, not funny jokes, saying dumb stuff that he shouldn't have been saying, and then when people start adding him on Facebook and adding him on Twitter and asking him on dates and asking him to sign up for Tinder and all the stupid things that they were doing, he signs up for all of that and the first thing they do is start going through his history. Just scroll down to the bottom, right? And they find this stuff. So what happened to him? Well, he's fired. 
okay? Uh, he is gone. And if you go in, I use archive.is for everything. You can go to the archive page and then you can get the actual URL if you want to go to it because for some of these sites it actually breaks the way that it loads. So you have to do a whole bunch of scrolling, just FYI, everybody. But people started going in there and tweeting about him, finding everything, linking to it, adding hashtags, so forth and so on. And eventually they built up enough um, social heat that somebody had to step in and tell him, hey, dude, you're gone. You're out of here. Lost his career because of this. And that's important for all of us, too. Because again, if you're in here, you're probably interested in things like cybersecurity, Linux, computers, all these different jobs. And guess what? A lot of those jobs require you to either get a background check, get some kind of clearance, so on and so forth. You do not want to be the person who has to sit down and they print it out a bunch of tweets and push them towards you on the table and ask, can you explain this? And also, we need you to sign this because you're out of here anyways. OK? So I'm putting that out there now. I usually tell people when they ask me, well, what social media should I use? None, unless you have a business. If you have a business, that's fine. Your business can have a social media presence because that's kind of necessary nowadays. Anybody here get a, a plumber? Would you get a plumber that doesn't have a, uh, some kind of social media presence or web page presence? Probably not. Some of you. Some people still do that, but a lot of people would look at that and be like, well, I don't know. What if you fly by night? I have no way of tracking this guy. There's no reviews. I can't go on Google and get a review. What about Yelp? Businesses, fine. You got a business, great. Make your social media, fine. But the personal stuff, I stay away from that. Um, just as a side note, when I was getting hired, I don't, have, I don't have Facebook for myself. I don't have Twitter for myself. I don't have anything for myself. When I got hired, they sent me down and they said, hey, we got to go through here. When I got hired here, we got to look at your stuff. What are you doing on social media? I said, I don't use that stuff. Stay away from it. And they looked at me and they were like, well, you don't have anything? And I was like, well, I can make you one if you want me to. I'll throw up some dog pictures or something. I don't care. Uh, and at the end of the thing, they were like, OK, yeah, fine. But it was one more thing that I didn't have to worry about as part of the hiring process. And for those of anybody who ever takes my classes, uh, like at Mesa, I usually tell them, start reviewing that stuff now. Because when you're 12, 13 years old, and you're saying dumb stuff on the internet, most of the time people will look at that and be like, OK, you're underage. We don't want to see that. Like, that's not important to us. But when you're 18, 19, 20, 25, 35 years old, and you're saying dumb stuff on the internet, people can still care. So eSports. I said we were going to get to it. Oh, does anybody have any questions about the Facebook thing? Go for it. Well, uh, just this past week, there was a girl in Alabama. And she was going to school there. And on Martin Luther King Day, she posted up a video being really racist uh, on Martin Luther King Day of all days. Uh, the very next day, she got kicked out of the sorority that she was in. Mm -hmm. the, I think within the same day, uh, the college that she was going to kick her out. Yeah. So it, it does follow you. Yep. It does. There, and there's proof of it, I mean, constantly. Go on Google and just type in idiot social media, and you can immediately start finding hit after hit after hit, go for it, man. I mean, there's, there's ultra open source alternatives to all social media, like, uh, I think it's mammoth.social. Yeah, talks. I've, got a, I've got a mammoth account on, my, on the Retro 64. I use that to communicate with people. And there's different communities. You're going to have different, again, open source slash. You have control over your information. <sighs> Kinda. I, don't. I have a lot more than Facebook. You have a lot more than Facebook, but you really don't. You don't have a lot of control because remember, like on Mammoth, if you want to go over like the Mammoth slash the Gab AIO or whatever, any of those items, yes, you can run your own server, but they're federated. So I start running my own server and I'm typing stuff in, but everything that I send still has to go out to other people's computers. So then they start saving it. And then all you're doing is making multiple offshore accounts of whatever dumb thing that you were doing over here anyways. And at what point does it go from being social, social interaction and, and having a persona online to, yes, I can absolutely, I can PGP encrypt 
every single thing that I send out and I can use Tor and I can use a pseudonym and I can pretend to be somebody else and I can use a fake image and all of that stuff, but then who am I, what am I, what am I trying to communicate? Maybe, maybe. Maybe you need to encrypt every single one of your, um, you know, your Harry Potter role plays. I mean, you, I mean, if you got to do it, you got to do it. Um, Any time you do something stupid that has a URL associated with it, remember that somebody that doesn't like that can <coughs> give it to archive.org and ask them to put it in their archive. Sure, that's what I do. They will go out and they will scrape the page for posterity. Yeah. And it's, if it's in a digital format, yeah. uh, we've gotten past the point where you know, things go away. They don't yeah, it doesn't, away. It, it, it doesn't go away. It doesn't. It doesn't go away. You can ask for that to be. I've got plenty of even articles they gone. Right? Aren't they taking requests to delete it? They don't. Uh, Nobody deletes problems. anything anymore, man. Yeah. Um, Nobody deletes anything. It's just, it's, it's not there. <coughs> so, eSports. Um, so, guilty pleasure. I'm just going to say it. I watch speed runs. Like, I do, because I don't have a lot of time to play video games. I'm working a job, plus I'm a teacher, plus I work on this stuff, plus I do public speaking, plus I have meetings I go to and all this other stuff. So I don't have time to play video games. So I watch somebody else play video games in a window using MPV and YouTube DL uh, so that I can still be like, oh, I like video games. But I don't really play video games anymore. I just watch somebody else play. That's part of that eSports thing. Um, there's a whole bunch of people who are involved in eSports. You have speedrunners. You have people who play video games professionally. When I was a kid, I wanted to grow up and I was going to play Unreal Tournament professionally. Like, that was going to be my life. I was going to be a 30-year-old Unreal Tournament player, hitting people with the Redeemer. Every time I turn around, 360 no scope, because I don't even think you had a scope in Unreal Tournament. You know what you did? There was a sniper rifle, but I never used it. Um, but then I found out that I had to do other stuff to support myself, because I wasn't super hardcore at Unreal Tournament. Um, but eSports is a huge industry. There's a lot of money to be made. There's people making money on YouTube. There's people making money with uh, the actual competitions. Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars are passing hands just off of single matches. There are people who are into gambling, uh, which if we go back up to Burris and that Tyler guy, what happens? Somebody bet $1.50 against somebody else. They lost the match. Somebody didn't want to pay the $1.50. And lo and behold, next thing you know, there's an innocent man dead. There's all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, if you look into some of our foreign nation allies like um, Korea, uh, they've got entire industries now built around helping people recover from video game addiction. Uh, you can actually go on YouTube and you can watch videos about people who have played video games for so long that they die sitting at their computer. They just have a heart attack. They have some sort of medical condition. They're sitting there. They're playing Dota. And the next thing you know, they pass away just right there in a chair. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff going on. But the eSports group, ESEA, discovered there's another way that people are trying to make money. And what ended up happening with them is their records were leaked. And they had 1.5 million records of what I'm guessing is a pretty wide age group of people, including individuals who are underaged as well as adults. Now, what do we know about this group? Let's just think criminal mindset. Let's all put on our, our bad guy hat, OK? Put on the black hat. What information do we have? Well, we got names. We got addresses. We got logins. How many people do you think under the age of 16 are using a password manager? All of them? If that. If that. So, right, all four of them. So, we got logins, we got names, we have their website URLs and things that they like, so like their Facebook, stuff like that. Whatever it is that they're using to kind of demonstrate to people who they are. 
So if you have an ESEA account and you have a Facebook, you link them together to show, hey, this is me. Uh, their Steam IDs, their Xbox IDs, their PSN IDs. Everybody knows that you can make a ton of money, right? Stealing Steam IDs, PSN IDs, Xbox IDs. Those are worth a, a huge chunk of change because they're usually hooked up to a credit card. And what people do is they get access to the account and then they'll buy the cash, like the little Xbox coins or the Sony PlayStation coin or whatever it is, their, their currency, right? Um, and I don't know the names for all of them. Even Steam has like Steam bucks. Anybody ever seen a Steam card for like 50 bucks at the grocery store? You know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, I just want to make sure everybody's following along. They will buy that stuff and then sell it. And then there is no way to recoup that. Once you sell that card, you've earned your money. That person's credit card has been hit. And if they don't pay for it, then all the stuff that they've already bought through Xbox Live, PSN Network, any of that stuff, that can be taken away. Anybody here remember how pissed off everybody was when they said instead of doing CDs, we were going to do like digital downloads? And how people were like, once we move away from physical media, that means somebody has control over what I can do with the thing that I bought. We all remember that idea? Okay. Like uh, right around PlayStation 2-ish started coming out and there were certain games that you could download, like the Final Fantasy game for PlayStation 2 uh, came with a hard drive. Like at that point, people started going, you know, I'm paying for this game and I don't have control over it. Well, you can manipulate that. Okay, you have made $700 in media purchases through PSN Network. So if you don't pay the 600 bucks, you're going to lose all of that stuff because when you do the chargeback on your credit card, they close your account. That's how that scam works. And essentially, somebody in between is stealing all of that. So we already have uh, a mechanism of fraud, right? getting into people's Steam, Xbox, or PSN IDs. That's a way of stealing money. So that's your, that's your first method of making a profit off of this. Your next method is, what about all the people who are looking at these kids to cause them harm? Abusers, you got a whole bunch of kids' information about what they're interested in. So now you have data about underage kids you have their contact information, you have their Facebooks, their Twitters, you have all of this stuff. It's not a huge leap to be able to send somebody a message that starts off with, hey man, I see you're interested in Counter-Strike. Me too. What's your favorite gun? And then to take it from there. So I, if I was a parent, would be concerned about that, extremely concerned about that, considering the fact that every piece of information that you need to, to begin that process of making contact with a child is all available now. Uh, and we haven't even gotten to what happened to ESEA, okay? We're just going through the list of what you can do with this data. You have addresses. Why do you have addresses? Because of the fact that you need to be able to pay for your bets, to be able to pay for different things that you're buying, your merchandise, so they kept all of that information. So potentially some kid got on there and was like, Mom, I want to buy a hat. Okay, here's my credit card, buy your hat. And now you have the address for that person, age, contact information, all kinds of other information about them. I can go on and on. And for anybody who's been in cybersecurity, just looking at that list, you kind of all have an idea of all the things that you can do to cause harm with this data. So then at the end of the day, this group who decided to do this reaches out to ESEA and says, hey guys, we have your information. Here's a small sample of it. We want you to give us $100,000 and we'll destroy it, which is 110% bullshit. They will never do that. Nobody's stupid enough to do that. This, this kind of data is an easy mechanism to a whole lot of profit and that $100,000, that's piddly. That's just a good way of getting started to start your advertisement campaign and contact people and to be able to, to put food on the table while you wait for the rest of your sales to go through. $100,000 is nothing when it comes to this kind of information. So what does the SEA do? They said no, which was actually smart. Uh, that was the, the, in, in, in the intelligent thing to do. So then these people come back and say, well, we stole some of your intellectual property. I'm sure that is not the word that was used, okay? 
believe me, they didn't say we took your intellectual property, but this is the, the information that's being released to the public. So they said, well, our intellectual property was stolen, our databases were stolen, here's all kinds of information about our clientele and all the people involved in this. And then in addition to that, they asked for $100,000 in cash. So they didn't pay them the $100,000. Well, the rest of the information is now online. You can go out and you can go pull this 1.5 million profiles if you know where to go look. You go poke around. And guess what? I did a class on the dark net. It was two hours. Showed everybody where people were buying drugs and selling drugs and so on and so forth and trading in that kind of information. So if you want to learn about what's going on with that, go watch that class because there's tons and tons of information in that class as well about where they're actually doing the marketing for this stuff. Where does this data show up? Uh, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. So at the end of the day, I, I think ESEA probably did the right thing. They came out and they told everybody what happened. They said what was stolen. They revealed the fact that there was an extortion attempt after working with law enforcement. So they contacted law enforcement and said, hey, these guys are working with us. What do you want to do? Uh, undoubtedly, they probably tried something and maybe it failed or they just were like, you know what, $100,000 isn't worth jail time. We don't care. We've got all this other information. We can use it for all kinds of other scams and stuff. We'll just deal with this. Uh, because when you think about it, if you have their Steam ID, then what are you doing? You're making phishing emails, right, for Steam. Got the Xbox ID, phishing emails, so on and so forth. I mean, all of it. You have the perfect set of ingredients to bake any kind of cybersecurity attack pie that you want to make. But at the end of the day, I think they did the right thing. They told everybody what happened. They gave them up. Any questions? No? OK, that one's pretty, like, Pretty simple, pretty basic. I mean, that's the, the traditional, get your data, see where we can manipulate you with it, and then if not, then you go out and you sell it or you use it for other things. It's a very general, like, that is the heart of cybersecurity right there. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's talk about Equifax and the music teacher. I like this one. Equifax makes me mad. So Equifax was hacked. Everybody knows that, right? Are we all aware that there was an Equifax breach? Is everybody aware of what Equifax does? Is there anybody in here that does not know who Equifax is or what they do? No? OK. So just for viewers at home, uh, if you do not know who Equifax is, they are a credit uh, scoring company. They help with making a decision on your credit. And then in addition to that, uh, they keep a database about all of your information. So very, very basic. Simple company, right? So what ended up happening, and they're claiming that it was about 50% of the US population. All right, so about half of us, the database leaked, and all of our data was leaked. And when I say all, I mean all. Like, I'm not kidding. All. Names, social security numbers, driver's license, jobs. Jobs, plural, every job that you've had, yes. It's not the information you think you understand as having. It's all of the information that anybody has linked to you, whether it's real or not. Correct, which I'll get to that in just a second. Because your business, like your company, whatever, whoever you work for, many of them have a, a process where like your payroll is handled by a company like ADP. And then that payroll company will report to Equifax. So whatever company that you're working with potentially has some sort of roundabout link that ends in Equifax. So has anybody here ever had to report information to Equifax? Probably only for clarifying things, right? Some of us have had to clarify something. You, and it says on your credit report, call us if you want to dispute, and then you make a dispute, and so on and so forth. Well, we'll get to that in a second, too, because the dispute database leaked, too. So if you've ever disputed anything, that dropped on the internet as well. But that's here in a minute. So not only 
every company you've ever worked for, your driver's licenses, your social, your every address you've ever lived at, so on and so forth. Go pull your credit report, freecreditreport.com or whatever. Uh, check with the FTC.gov first. They have a way that you go to that and then you can pull a credit report every year. You pull that information and essentially that is on the internet somewhere with all of your data in it, okay? So we're, I think everybody's tracking on what a serious thing this is and what a big deal it is. Can't, can't tell you enough. So 50% of the US population at minimum hit, at minimum 50%, right? So then they finally, after about a year, year and a half, somebody finally gets up and is like, we probably need to tell people. So we should probably make an announcement. So they did. They made an announcement and their stock plummeted 15% essentially immediately, okay? And these are billion dollar companies, so 15% of, and you can do the math yourself, it's a lot of money lost psh, overnight. So then their senior security executive immediately retires and before retiring, scrubs her LinkedIn, scrubs her Facebook, scrubs her Twitter, go, essentially goes through all of her social media and gets rid of everything. And a whistleblower goes to somebody, and you can look all this up if you're interested in doing so. I didn't link to all of it because it's, it's up to you all to go look into this. This whistleblower goes to a cybersecurity expert and says, hey, you should look into this lady. You need to see. And then it turns out that all of her degrees and every training and everything that she's ever done has been in music. And she's listed as the chief information security officer. And I'm just gonna put it out here right now. You don't have to go to school in IT to be good at IT. I can tell you that right now. Because if you think about it, there are people who to this day are still alive who have worked in IT before IT was a thing, okay? That's, that's just how it was. You had a guy who was really, really good at math and you had another guy who was a, a it's software, an electrical engineer, and they got together and they built a computer, whether it was 8-bit or whatever, but you don't have to. However, when you are put down as the chief information security company for a security officer for a company as large as Equifax, and then you come out and you tell everybody, well, I don't actually have a team of dudes or anybody. I just, I'm the face of security and also, I just deleted all of my social media and all of my accounts, and I'm hiding who I am. And then in addition to that, when they said, well, did you tell people to update computers and verify security? Did you, did you do any best practices? She essentially came out and was like, well, we have one guy. One guy for the entire Equifax company who was in charge of quote unquote security. And I have no idea what he was doing. So every day she showed up to work and she got a huge fat paycheck and essentially the entire cybersecurity division for Equifax was just like this giant sham. There was nothing going on there from what they say, which kind of seems weird, like at the very least, like as far as investigations go, I, that would be a thing that I would be wanting to look at, right? So she retires immediately, like pff, I'm gone, out. So then the Equifax CEO doesn't awesome thing and instead of trying to fix stuff pins a letter an op-ed jumps in there pins this letter and essentially it's like hey we lost all your data it sucks thanks stay cool and at the end of that that goes out people don't like that it makes a whole bunch of people really angry so then senators start investigating we start having actual lawmakers who start stepping in to look at this stuff, right? And as soon as the senators step in and start looking at this and they start talking about, well, responsibility. Who needs to be in trouble for this? There needs to be punishment, right? Uh, then your Equifax chief information officer and the chief security officer, the next ones, they immediately quit. <laughs> They're gone, out. So then Equifax decides, you know what? We're gonna tell everybody how to protect themselves. So they jump on Twitter and they start the process of re-victimizing everyone because what they do is 
started sending people who were victims of this attack to a web page that did a drive-by download for malware from their Twitter account. Do you all follow me? Did everybody hear what I said? So all of these people who have been victimized, who have had their data stolen, then in a panic start trying to communicate with Equifax who says view our web page we built this web page and we built a Twitter and we built all of these things specifically designed to communicate with you the public and this entire system is designed to funnel you through a system so you can find out if you're affected spoiler alert yes you're affected okay super spoiler you are but after they said this is how we're going to protect the public what does it do? It sends, this, sends all of these people to a web page that starts trying to install malware on their system. And essentially what happened uh, after that was a security researcher then decides to register a address that is a few characters off from the address that they registered and then creates a Twitter account to start tricking people to go to his web page just to show that they have there are mounting mistakes over and over and over again. Everything that you can do wrong, they did it wrong. Didn't it go so far that Equifax himself started giving out his domain instead? I was just going to add, um, don't accept anything from Equifax because I think they offer a year of identity theft and there was some clause in there where it accepted it. Like a New York contacted uh, that, so that goes back to part of what's going on with the senators, but the New York lawyers, a bunch of New York lawyers, got involved in that and they removed that clause and said that no, that's not part of it. But I'm going to tell you right now, have you ever heard the term too big to fail? Equifax is one of those things that they'll bend over backwards to protect. Like the, even the sheer mention of opt-in for credit sent ripples through everything. I mean, they had panic attacks about that. I don't think it's going to happen. I would add just one last thing. Um, since they have the social security numbers, that information gets more valuable. And you probably, I think it was a, it was a guy that made that movie about Catch Me If You Can. He spoke about it. He Kevin Mitnick. Huh? huh? Kevin Mitnick yeah. is the guy. No, 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 no. The guy from the 60s, the uh, fraudulent guy. He the one who pretended to be an airline pilot? Yeah, he still works for the FBI. Okay. He, he spoke on it and he said that since they have your so security number that they won't sell that information till about five years out, and because that's when it will be that's peak of its value. So with any kind of protection or anything that people are trying to sell because of this, uh, it's basically useless right now. Oh yeah, it's always going to be useless. Yeah, I mean, common. I mean, you won't see, you won't start seeing the real effect of this till about five years out. Well, wait till tax time. Tax time is when it's going to really hit because people are going to be making fraudulent tax returns and that's going to be the yeah you'll I wouldn't doubt if half the country is going to log into TurboTax in the next couple of weeks and find out that their taxes have already been submitted like because you can make up anything you want put anything you want in the boxes and set it up to deliver into an account and yank the money out of the account and we're going to be arresting mules all over the country for money laundering I mean it's it's going to be a huge mess. That's, that's on the way. So then, at some point, Equifax, their CEO quit. He was like, all right, I'm out. I can retire. I'm done. I don't want to have anything to do with this. So he walks away. And then they announce 2.5 million more people could be victims. Could be. They don't know. But the, the number continues to rise. Okay, And then, when they finally got into a Senate hearing, and they had to sit down and actually start, hey, somebody needs to actually explain what happened and what's going on and what you're going to do to rectify this issue. They admitted mistakes were made. And that's all. And that's where we're kind of at right now. Somebody messed up. The Argentine Equifax systems uh, were discovered after this to still have a uh, admin ID and admin password. Yeah, uh, that's going to be this one right here. Yeah, and um, they, one of the big problems that they did with the uh, research is uh, checking to see if you were hacked or not 
they didn't use a subdomain of their well-known Equifax.com. They went out and they bought a new one and set it up on that one like a fishing expedition would. Well, the other problem is that they never actually checked anything. It was a random like number generator that essentially said yes or no. And you could come back and put your information into it two or three different times, and every time you'd get a different answer. It was a selling site. Right. Yeah, it wasn't real. So when they sent that out, it wasn't real. I'm looking into the crowd, and I'm starting to see some angry faces, like that frowny face that says, oh, I'm a little upset about this. Um, that's good, because right now they're in the process of trying to change some of the laws because of Uber. And I'm hoping that with Equifax and Uber and all this other stuff that's going on, more people will get involved in like going to the court webpage and sending messages, communicating with people, and telling people you want to see something done. These uh, there are three credit bureaus uh, right. throughout the nation: TransUnion, Equifax, and and uh, uh, anybody know? It's very, it's very true. True. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the reason that this is affecting only 50% of the population is because they tend to be somewhat regional uh, in their base of operations. And TransUnion is in California, I think uh, one's in Texas, and I think Equifax is out of Atlanta. I believe TransUnion, though, is also British. Um, like they, Their ownership may be a little, they may be owned by other people. But um, they basically, if you get credit from uh, a business, the business will report to Equifax your transaction history. If you buy a car with credit, or even just buy a car with cash, that seller is going to report it to Equifax or one of the other ones. Sure. And um, basically they all, everybody that you interact with that creates any kind of data, whether it's financial, nowadays anything else, uh, they contribute that to this central hub in order to get access. Right. So that when you know Bob Smith comes up and wants to rent an apartment, they know whether he's got a you know skip record or something in it yeah. in his history. Which is why everybody including your payroll and so on and so forth, they all report. That's why they're all interconnected. Yeah. Any recommendations for mitigation, like uh, petition the Social Security Administration to get a new SSN or get a tax card identification number separate from your SSN? I think that right now you would have problems doing that because you can put a you can put like a block on your your credit account and you can say hey block everything, and for certain places that'll work and for certain places it won't. Um, there are different recommendations from different places. I'll leave it all up to you. I'm not going to give you any kind of recommendations on what to do in terms of protecting your finances just on account of the fact that <sighs> A, this is probably the most ridiculous thing that could have possibly happened. B, we all knew it was going to happen eventually. And C, uh, really the problem that we have now was created by them because of the tool that they created. And unless they go in there and start making major changes, there's just not a lot of things that we can do to like escape right now. There is no opt out. There's no way to protect yourself from this stuff. You can tell them, hey, put a lock on my credit, but not everybody's going to respect that. So that potentially, yeah, because they'll have all the data necessary and to you do that. To put a lock on all three credit bureaus, and there are actually four or five uh, that put a couple of specialized ones. Um, also, uh, you can request a social security number change, but you, um, that, the government's about to shut down, so that's not going to happen. And also, um, you might think about not um, having any uh, uh, tax um, withheld, because uh, if you go to a big juicy account at the IRS, uh, getting that tax and taken is uh, what they can do by filing. You know, I had talked to a lawyer before you start digging around with your taxes. Hit me. It's all bullshit. They, they don't. That's the thing. And go look up the guy who gave out his social security number on LifeLock 
And then even he had something like 40-something people steal from him, including a person who was considered mentally ill slash challenged, uh, like with Down syndrome, was a person who stole his identity. Isn't LifeLock paid out by Equifax somehow? They're semantic, aren't they? I, that I don't know. I, you'd have to look that one up. LifeLock can be hired by people who have been hacked to service the victims by trying to sell them more product. No, I, I think I'm pretty like 90% sure that Equifax yeah, actually it's pays a, it's out it's LifeLock a, directly. Do, oh, do they? Uh, yeah. I, I almost okay. want to say that the parent company is semantic. <laughs> Well, Somehow, I think somebody I can that. Google it. Just Get your phone. Calls. I, I know they demonstrated at the uh, WAS meeting how they got in. It was the using stress vulnerability. Mm -hmm. it's pretty amazing, like just serialize an object and you just you literally just typed in cat Etsy password and he sent it through like through a web page with no input on it, just literally a hyperlink and the rest of the blank. And it sucked up the object and it ran it. <laughs> gave me Passwords. Which that <laughs> vulnerability had been patched something like a year and a half ahead of time. And then they had been sent information that said, you need to patch this. And what it sounds like ended up happening was a whole bunch of people got told to, somebody needs to patch it. And it went around sort of like playing telephone, go patch this. And then at the end of the day, nobody ever did. And so what ended up happening was that thing was available and vulnerable for that long. And in addition to that, that vulnerability was one of those ones that you could test for. You could find it very, very easily, like automated. And it's very questionable as to whether that was the problem or whether they had equally lax password uh, choices. Well, like on their database itself, yeah, they used admin admin for the username and password. So. It's still up and running on their Argentine operations yeah. months after this, this happened. Somebody went down and they tried it down there. So, so we're, we're going to get to that here when we finally get to Marissa Mayer. But yeah. Here's if there was any speculation as to who the assailants were. If there was yeah. a group or there was a. Actually, they're, they're thinking that this was nation state. So they're like Russia, somebody similar. They believe that somebody using techniques that leave fingerprints that are similar to known groups potentially could have done this to take that information for other reasons. Just like, why would you want the OPM data, right? Oh, social security numbers, top secret clearances. You have all kinds of information about people. Very, very similar situation. Uh, let's talk about Yahoo, because that gets back to where we're going to talk about like the admin admin for usernames and passwords and stuff like that. Uh, Yahoo was hacked, again. But like again, again, and not just that one time or that other time before that, but yes, another time. Like this is a new Yahoo attack because they've been hit several times now. Um, I want to talk about the tragedy that is Yahoo uh, for a moment. Because <laughs> it's kind of depressing and we need that uh, today. Why not? So Yahoo was worth a whole bunch of money, like a lot of money, billions of dollars. And then Microsoft stepped in and was like, we want to give you billions and billions and billions of dollars because we want the Yahoo IP for whatever silly thing Microsoft wanted to do with it. And somebody was a super genius and was like, oh, we don't need to sell to them. Yahoo's awesome. Everybody loves Yahoo. We're going to be making money forever. And so they refused the sale. And by the next year, they had lost billions and billions and billions of dollars in valuation. I mean, they just tanked straight into the ground. And then people started breaking into Yahoo over and over, which I don't really know why you would want to break into Yahoo because it's probably 99% like fake emails that were created specifically for signing up for like pornographic web pages and stuff. Like, I'm not exactly sure. Yes. The generation that is just older than us is living with Yahoo email accounts and they're running all their banks information through their Yahoo account. It's a gold mine. Oh, I'm. They're all in their 70s and 80s. They've got monster bank accounts, investment accounts. If you're going to, to fish those people, yes. You're, you're going to figure that out anyways, but 
Yahoo has been hit over and over and over again. If you're using Yahoo Stop, do I need to say that? Okay. So if you're using Yahoo, stop using Yahoo. Like stop. Uh, after all of their accounts were hacked, essentially billion accounts got popped. Um, I think they tried to not say anything for a little bit. And of course, it sort of makes sense because you're not going to say anything because you're in the middle of trying to sell this flailing dumpster fire. Like you want to get rid of it. And so they tried not saying anything. Well, Marissa Mayer, she gets picked up and they tell her, you got to come talk to the Senate. Man, I'll tell you what, the Senate's been working hard. Like I can't believe how many people they've been interviewing, like six people. Um, and they asked her, how did Yahoo get hacked? And she said, well, I don't know. And he said, okay. How did Equifax get hacked? And they said, well, I don't know. They, they were sort of doing it like the team thing, tag team. And she wore a really neat sweater. You don't get to see the picture here, but it was like a Christmas sweater that she wore. Um, it was very interesting. So she shows up and she tells them, I don't know what's happening. I don't know why it happened. I don't know what's going on. I can't tell you. And then they said, well, what are you going to do about it? And she said, well, hacking is really, really sophisticated, and we just can't keep up with it. Okay? Like, we can't keep up with the sophistication of what's going on with these attacks. And they said, well, what happened? Well, it turns out somebody got spearfished. Okay? One of the lead guys over at Yahoo received a message that essentially, I guess, must have looked pretty official because he clicked on it and he put his username and password into it. And that username and password was used pretty much everywhere in the company. And so somebody spearfishes their way in. The word for 2018 is sophisticated. And I want you to use it as much as possible because we need to get rid of it. Like, just play that word out for me, please. If somebody sends you a message and they ask you, how's lunch, you tell them it was sophisticated. It was, it was good. Because I want that word gone, especially when we're talking about cybersecurity. Because a spear phishing account, that's not sophisticated. That's cybersecurity 101. Has anybody ever had to live through one of those military cybersecurity training things where they're like, what do you do with your, if your BlackBerry gets stolen? and you're not allowed to answer, chase the guy down and beat him. Like you have to give them like the answers that they ask. They teach you about spear phishing to the lowest, lowest, lowest person on the totem pole, all the way up to the highest. Everybody knows what spear phishing is, right? Anybody here not? Show of hands, embarrass yourself. Okay, cool. That's okay. So, it, so the idea behind spear phishing is, is let's say that I need access to an account, uh, your Yahoo account. So I know that you have a business and you have a Yahoo account and you're using that Yahoo account. And so I'm going to go do some research about you. I'm going to go find your Facebook. I'm going to go find your Twitter. I'm going to find whatever social media you have. And I'm going to try to design a email or some kind of crafted response to you that would be plausible because I know enough of information about you. So let's say that you're into cars, and I can make an assumption that you own a Corvette from everything that I've seen, and so on and so forth. So I send you a message that says your Chevy account is about to be uh, shut down for whatever reason, and I need you to log in. So I go and I go to the Chevy webpage, and I get all the information about Corvettes that I can, and I build a login that looks exactly like the actual Chevy login using HT, tra HT track. And once I have that all built, then I build a back end to it that's going to steal your data and I send you to it. And you put in your username and you put in your password and I grab that username and password and then I push you on back to the, the actual Chevy web page maybe. So now I have your information because I sent you something that was targeted just for you that was a very high likelihood that you were going to click. Regular phishing is stuff like, have you ever gotten the Nigerian Prince email? And it comes out and it says, hey, I'm a Nigerian prince. I got millions and billions and billions and trillions of dollars. And I don't have anywhere to go. And I don't know what I'm going to do. But if you give me $50,000, I'll send you a truck load with a pallet full of money or something. That's kind of fishing. You throw that out there and you just hope somebody bites. And you're waiting for somebody to grab onto that. Whereas with spear phishing, the idea is I want to give you something that is realistic, 
as realistic as I can possibly get it. I'm going to make everything look as perfect as I possibly can, and I'm going to do it very personalized for you to really make it so that you don't even second guess what's going on. I want to make it look real. That's, it's, a, it's a targeted attack at a specific person that's just made just for that person. A, a spear phishing attack that I created for you probably wouldn't work for him or for her or for anybody else in the room. Okay, That's the idea behind that. So their very sophisticated hacker probably went and looked up Yahoo Security on LinkedIn, found out who this guy was, and sent him a message or knew who one of their vendors were. Everybody remember when Google was getting screwed out of millions and millions of dollars by somebody who was sending them invoices from a vendor that they had? And they were paying it, they were just paying out the ear? Yeah, you remember that? So Google, this happened to Google and it happened to a few other companies, they buy servers, right? So somebody started creating invoices that looked like they came from the companies that they were buying server hardware from and just sending them the invoice and somebody at Google was just rubber stamping and paying it and they ended up paying out millions and millions of dollars to a fake company that was just sending them requests for money that looked very similar to one of the companies that they worked with. And you can look that up because it was a huge embarrassment for Google, Microsoft, I think Yahoo got pulled on this one too. There's just a bunch of companies because there's only a handful of companies that make those kinds of servers, right? There's only so many people that they work with. It's kind of, I'm going to use the word incestual. It's all very like very tight-knit, closed community. So somebody just figured out what their bill looked like and started flashing the bill to everybody and people were sending in checks. Sort of the same idea. It's not sophisticated, guys. It's not. It's not sophisticated. That's the wrong word to use. Nobody is a super genius breaking into these systems, doing magical things. This is computer security 101. <laughs> The genius part is laundering that check once you get it. Well, that guy didn't do that. The, the Google guy, he was just grabbing the money and eventually they just went and arrested him when they found out millions and millions of dollars were missing. Yeah, because it had to go clear through his checking account. I mean, hell, at that point, they probably should have just let him keep the money. <laughs> Let's get to shadow brokers. Shadow brokers leaked a bunch of stuff from the NSA. Anybody remember WannaCry? All of that WannaCry stuff that came from shadow brokers who came out and said, hey, we grabbed all this information about the NSA and all these NSA attacks and hacks and leaks and so on and so forth. We're going to take all this data and we're going to start passing it out to people, okay? So this is where that starts. So this is the, this is the top of the pyramid. It starts with shadow brokers and then we're going to move down to some of these other attacks because they start playing off of what came out of shadow brokers. So who are they? Well, they're mysterious. They had access to a whole ton of national security agency secrets, and then they began dumping those secrets on the internet. And they exposed these vulnerabilities in Cisco stuff, Microsoft stuff, Linux stuff. Uh, pretty much if you were connected to the internet in some way, they had data or a method of exploiting whatever it was that you were using. Okay? They just had it all. Everything was coming to them. And in addition to that, uh, as soon as people started using this stuff, the shadow broker stepped in and started saying, if you do not start helping these companies close their security holes, we're going to just keep releasing more and more stuff. We're just going to let it all loose. We're going to burn this whole thing to the ground. We're going to give out all the information we have about every single exploit that we've got, and we're going to put it all out there. Now, of interest is the fact that we still don't know who these people are. Okay, Billions of dollars spent every year in gathering information in a data center up in Utah that costs millions of dollars a day to operate, where pretty much all of our information passes in and out of that place. I mean, with everything that we're doing, for whatever reason, right now, we still don't know who these people are. Weird. Uh, in addition to that, they're saying that the information that they were leaking was coming from external staging servers, which is weird, from 2013. 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure how true that is because we're going to get to Harold Martin here in a second. And Harold Martin is probably going to help us figure out a little bit more about where this stuff actually happened. So once they released all this information, um, WikiLeaks jumped on it. They had some of this stuff. But then very, very quietly, an arrest was made. Now, I just said the name Harold Martin. Anybody know who Harold Martin is? A few people? No? Not really? OK. So I said hey, very, very quietly, and I'm not kidding. The what? No. We'll talk about her in a minute, too. She, that, yeah, that was a total not smart thing to do. So what Harold Martin was was an NSA contractor. Who do you think he worked for? Same company that Edward Snowden worked for. No. It starts with a B. Nope. Booz Allen Hamilton. Booz Allen Hamilton. OK. Booz has had egg on their face for a few years now. I feel kind of bad for them. They're really getting beat up on hiring people who just can't seem to keep it together. Um, so Harold Martin, take a step back. Here's a question for you all. You don't have to answer if you don't want to. Does anybody here have a 10 terabyte hard drive at home? Single hard drive, 10 terabytes. Anybody? I don't. I don't. The biggest hard drive I have is four terabytes. I have two of them, RAID 0. Anybody have a five terabyte hard drive? No. OK. Four terabyte? A couple of us? OK. So everybody here has a pretty good idea of what it costs to buy a multi terabyte hard drive of that size. And then in addition to that, we all have a pretty good idea of really how big something like two terabytes is, right? Like, that's a huge amount of information. So what Harold Martin did was he went out and he stole 50 terabytes, 50 terabytes of NSA data and took it home. That took trips. I guarantee that was multiple trips. That was not... I'm going to go in and plug a thumb drive into a computer and drag and drop and walk out of that place because I forgot to do something with this. 50 terabytes is a ton of data. Maybe he had like so, a sample array with him or something. I <laughs> so did you walk out with disk drives or did you move the information out? I don't know. I don't know how he did it. But he worked there for many, many years. So potentially from the day he... Uh, well, actually, if you read right here, they said that he did it over 20 years. Because I know he worked there for, for a long time. So they're saying over a 20-year period, he walked out with 50 terabytes worth of data from the NSA. That's still a ton of data on a... So divide by 20, so roughly it's, uh, what, uh, two, two, point two gigs what's are per year or something? Or, no, two... If you spin that many disks, your power company notices you. I mean, you would think. That, that's a separate, a separate part that when you have data transfers, uh -huh. the NSA is supposed to have sentry and monitoring systems. Correct. So there's no way if I try to download something from Retro 64 to uh, two gig, 200 gigs, you should get an email. Someone is doing something. You would think, but they, I mean, obviously they don't. All the stuff that we kind of give them credit for, it's obvious that they're not doing that stuff. Or somebody's not. Somebody at Booz Allen Hamilton obviously never checked that email when it popped up and said warning with his ID next to it over a 20 year period. Somebody just was like, well, that's OK. Maybe Harold was running the caching server. But you would think that this organization in itself would be a skiff. There'd be no way that you could bring electronics in or out of the NSA. That's just astounding to me. You know, even a flash drive or anything. I mean, that's that would a, be confiscated at the door. Twenty years ago, probably that was the last thing in their minds. Yeah. Sure. Well, and in addition to that, I mean, they will tell you that stuff. And of course, if you're concerned about things like prison, 
which maybe this guy wasn't concerned about. Maybe he didn't care. Yes, there is. I mean, I've, I've been inside of like the Haida, and I've been inside of some of the, the Bortac places and things like that, where when you walk up, they have a place that says, put all your electronics here. Like, take this stuff, and then you're supposed to put it there, and then you walk away from it. And, but really, honestly, it is kind of like Scout's Honor. Like, yes, I took my cell phone and I put it in there. And yes, I secured my other stuff in there. But if I really wanted to, I could wear a watch with a USB hookup in it. They sell them on Amazon. I mean, I could put a USB drive in the sole of my boot. I mean, if you really wanted to. There's, I mean, it, it really is. It's Scout's Honor. Nobody's going to sit there and, and run a USB drive sniffing dog over you. I mean, they just they don't. And they, there is an expectation that you go to training and you know about this stuff and they trust you. Which earlier, when this first started, I put up Julius and Ethel Rosenberg up here. They were the individuals who, put, who were put to death for leaking nuclear state secrets to Russia. Okay? When we made the atom bomb, these two or maybe just one of them, gathered up a bunch of information and gave enough information to the Russians for them to be able to kickstart their nuclear ambitions, at which point, once they did so, it was discovered that they had done this and they were immediately put to death. They killed them. Okay? And I also believe that they hold the record for also being the last people to be put to death for any kind of like seditious behavior here in the US. I think that that's another record that they hold. Uh, after that, they just started putting people in prison. Treasonous, seditious. Okay. Oh, treasonous. So, um, this guy stole for 20 years, took 50 terabytes of stuff. Nobody ever figured it out. And then, in addition to that, the government isn't telling anybody what he was doing with the data. But, Shadow Brokers finds a whole bunch of information, starts leaking it out everywhere, they trace some of that information back somewhere, and then eventually they make an arrest on this guy who they hadn't figured out he was doing it for 20 years until they just recently found out he was doing this. I'm thinking that there's something there. Just call it a hunch. Can't be sure, but um, in addition to that, has anybody heard, and this is sort of a 28 thing, 2018 thing, but uh, a whole bunch of Chinese assets went silent. Everybody know about that? We had a whole bunch of assets in China that just miraculously people started figuring out that they worked for the US government. They started killing them left and right. And then we find out that one of the individuals who was working for our intelligence agencies, um, I guess he took a notebook full of names, telephone numbers, and addresses for our spies home with him after he quit because he wasn't getting paid enough. He didn't feel he was getting paid enough, so he grabs this notebook and he leaves with it, goes to China, and then the next thing you know, we lose asset after asset after asset. Well, they lured him back to the US and apparently they finally arrested him. So whether or not they're gonna charge him or not, they haven't said, and there's a bunch of people who are very pissed off about this, but our entire intelligence community, like something's going on there, in terms of them having a lot of problems and probably somebody needs to start looking at this because hey what's that we got another one reality winner who I would just like to put it out there that Karl Mark force the third had a much better name than reality winner everybody know who Karl Mark force the third is that was the guy who stole a bunch of bitcoins and put a bulletproof vest and a gun and a bunch of other stuff inside of a duffel bag and tried to escape the country after busting Dread Pirate Roberts. No? Okay. If you watch some of my previous classes, you get to find out about that guy too. Um, this dude decided he was going to escape the country with a ton of money that he had stolen while they were bringing down uh, the Silk Road. So he was part of the Silk Road investigation. And then he decided to try to bounce with all the ill-gotten gains that he had. They ended up arresting him right at the airport. It's a pretty interesting talk. So this lady decided to go out and print a bunch of reports on a government 
printer, which everybody knows how she got caught, right? Oh, the yellow dots on the printer that, okay, right. yeah. So it's HP stuff, yeah. Your printer will print a fingerprint on pages. So when you print something, there is an actual fingerprint that's within the data that has been placed on the page that you can verify against to figure out what that printer is. So when you work for the NSA or the CIA or law enforcement or anything like that and you go out and you print a piece of paper, if they have access to that original piece of paper, they can actually look for those dots and figure out what printer you used. Yes. Well, the date, time, who printed it, this and that, the serial of the printer, there's the a manufacturer, I mean. There's a ton of information, but it's, a, it, it's essentially a fingerprint, okay? They can, they can figure out where you printed this thing by looking at the information that's within the printing page, okay? So this lady, for better or for worse, she decides she's going to print out this stuff. Uh, she claims that she placed it inside of her pantyhose and then snuck it out and uh, went and sent it around to people. She was trying to give this information out into the world, and her claim was, well, I wasn't trying to be Snowden. Okay. Uh, you, I probably shouldn't have to say this, but you really shouldn't be doing things like this. Okay? Leaking information from an investigation, and this goes back to all my law enforcement people, you, they know that. You should know that. If you're involved in an investigation, you don't leak information about that investigation because things could be at play that you don't know about, okay? Especially when it's something this big. Um, me being involved in law enforcement, uh, maybe I'm not the best example for this, but I'm a firm believer that when you're doing an investigation, you can't trust essentially anybody. You're working on that investigation. You never who know who's involved in what or what's going on. So you compartmentalize and you work on that thing. And if somebody comes to you and, and generally if they're above you and they say something to you, then you take that information and you work with it. If that is good information, great. And if it's bad information or it hurts you, well, maybe you need to figure out something. And it goes from there. Uh, it's just sort of the, the life cycle slash process there is an investigation out that she was upset about and she decided she wanted to leak information about that investigation. And honestly, from what everybody's saying, she probably hurt that investigation tremendously by what she did. She made a decision trying to do something that she thought helped and it didn't. Uh, and for whoever was involved in that investigation, she probably hurt them more than she helped them. So regardless of her intention, uh, she made a mistake there, and she's going to get punished for it. Um, Harold Martin, though, he's being punished. He just got a 10-year sentence, and he's up for, uh, I want to say, 13 or 14 more counts, potentially at 10 years a pop right now. He did plead guilty for one count, but the rest of those counts, they have not been done. He's probably going to, to jail for life is what it sounds like. The way that they're handling this thing, that guy is not going to get out of prison. He's, they are saying that he did more harm than Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, that he is the, the worst thing that could have possibly happened to the intelligence community in a long time. In addition to that, they're claiming that his computers that he was storing that 50 terabytes on were all infected with malware and other uh, bad software. Like, the whole thing is a ridiculous, terrible show that is probably a huge embarrassment for a lot of people, which is why some people don't know his name, because they really did just try to make that very quiet. So a little while after that, guess what happened? Wanna cry. Yep, as soon as all this information started coming out and all this stuff started to drop and shadow brokers got involved and they started dropping information, uh, what they did was they told everybody, hey, we have nation state level exploits. We're going to start leaking these exploits. You have X number of days to get a fix available. And then after that, you guys are on your own, which is interesting. It's very interesting to me that they were making these politically active statements when they could have been making millions and billions of dollars. 
like the data that they had available to them was worth way more than the political statements that they decided to make with it, but they, they chose this path. So shortly after that, once they did all that and they said, okay, we're gonna release this stuff, they gave everybody six to eight months to get their computers updated, and then they released the information, and within days you had WannaCry. And WannaCry was able to install ransomware on systems using the exploits that were made available. And I have a breakdown on some of my previous talks where I actually break down how they were able to handle the WannaCry and do all of the ransom and get into the system, yeah? Yes. Yep. Yeah, where you could send data slowly through the login page until eventually you wrote enough and, yep. And like I said, go back through my other talks. If you go to the search and type in WannaCry, you can find inside of the search on my page. You can actually see a breakdown of where I talk about the whole thing. So what they're doing is encrypting stuff. Everybody knows about like ransomware, kind of. Uh, Ransomware being the, the act of getting into a computer, encrypting the computer, making it no longer available for use until you pay X amount of money to get your data back, oftentimes designed to uh, move lateral as well as up if at all possible. So if you have other users on the network, it's going to try to get out to those other users so it can encrypt their data as well, so on and so forth. Um, again, they're making a ton of money off of this stuff. It's easy money. And that it's not going to stop. They've discovered the goose that lays the golden egg, and this thing is just going to keep going. Um, WannaCry was a really, really big deal. But in addition to the, the, the situation that happened with that, I want to talk about the gentleman who was arrested at Black Hat. Or I'm sorry, not Black Hat, DEF CON. Uh, what's that? Okay, so there was an arrest made because a gentleman decided, or a gentleman claimed to have found the kill switch for WannaCry, and as soon as he found that kill switch, he registered a URL, and then the whole thing shut down. And um, they sort of lauded him as a hero, said that he was a superstar, hero, excellent guy. Um, his I want to say his Twitter handle was Malwaretech. I don't know the guy's name. Uh, I just know him by his Twitter handle of Malwaretech. Now, when a guy began spreading, you had people from every single agency in the world looking at this thing. British intelligence, US, uh, Microsoft. This want to cry hit the national health system out there in Britain. All of these things were falling down very quickly, right? And then this sort of relative nobody jumps in, immediately finds the cure for WannaCry, and shuts the whole thing down. Right around the time that they start making announcements that uh, you know potentially it's going to kill people because of what's happening at the NHS. Okay. Now, I'm going to be a little bit of a conspiracy here theorist here. This gentleman jumps in there and finds the cure, right? Shuts the whole thing down. Now, for those of you who have never worked in law enforcement, if you've ever had to investigate an arson, sometimes you'll find that the person who discovered the thing on fire or put out the fire was often the person who put the fire there in the first place, OK? Um, Malware tech shuts this whole thing down, and then he goes to DEF CON, and then while at DEF CON, he gets super drunk, and parties real hard is his claim, and then government swoops in, picks him up, arrests him. And then we find out that he was involved in some credit card scams, and he was involved in essentially a bunch of black hat stuff designed to make him money, okay? But the people that he had contact with were potentially people who could have worked on or asked for help with what was going on with WannaCry. Like he was in that group. I 
And again, just personal opinion, but I wouldn't be surprised if one day we find out that he was involved in some way in designing and building this thing, and then they cut it loose, and it grew faster than they expected it to. You know, you take the matches, and you throw them on the wood pile, and poof, the wood pile turns into a giant blaze, and he runs out and grabs a water hose and puts the thing out, and then tells everybody, look, I'm a hero, and, uh, because it's kind of hard for me to think that with all the eyes that were on that system, it was just some rando dude who just found the, the cure for it. Doesn't usually happen like that. Haven't really ever seen that, so first time for everything. But interesting. So then, during this period, uh, a lot of people don't really keep up with what's going on in Russia and the Ukraine and that whole area in terms of malware and stuff, but there was an attack called Petia, and then another one called Not Petia that was happening, that, which was kind of their version of WannaCry in a way. Uh, it was designed to target people in Russia and in the Ukraine, but of interest here was they weren't trying to make money. They designed the ransomware, they set it up, and then all the back end that they needed to do to make sure that they could accept bitcoins and all that stuff. They didn't do any of that. They didn't care. They just cut this thing loose and it started encrypting people's data and then they just left it there. It was just destroying people's information. It wasn't designed to make anybody any money. There was no kind of backup for it. There was nothing really there for them to be able to accept money in any way. Nothing of the sort. It was just designed to start destroying and breaking things. And they cut that loose over there. And there wasn't a whole ton of uh, information about it. I mean, it really didn't affect us. It affected Russian-speaking countries. Other than based on some Ukrainian accounting software? Well, well, they were the initial avenue of release for that. Like, that's how it got out there initially. Which, essentially, it's just get somebody to download something and click on it, and then away they go. Bad Rabbit, another one that was happening over there. Uh, they disguised theirs as a flash update. Again, if we can get you to click on something, if we can get you to say yes, 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 continue, yes, and then hit the button, then we can get access to anything. That's NBC, right? NBC never be clicking because most people operate on ABC, always be clicking, and we want NBC. You gotta teach people, stop clicking on things, especially whenever it offers you an update and it's not coming from somewhere that you asked for. And to be honest with you, for some of these things, even if you ask for it and you go to the right web page, it doesn't matter because they could potentially have already put a whole bunch of malware inside of something. What happened with Linux Mint, right? So Linux Mint, their entire development chain and the, the system of releasing copies of Linux Mint got popped and somebody was able to inject malware directly into the ISO and then distribute it. So people were installing infected copies of Linux Mint. The funny part about that is that same guy ended up breaking into the web server and changed the MD5 key. He did. He changed the MD5 so that when you checked it, but then he looked. And nobody ever actually checked the MB5, so it didn't matter, and he was pissed off. Well, because nobody ever checks that. Yeah. Who does? Other than, well, I, I do sometimes. Sometimes. I don't always do it. Um, this one's pretty interesting. 200 million voters had their information leaked online. So I'm not going to make, they were all supposed to be uh, 200 million registered US voters that are all part of the GOP. But you should look up the number of registered voters in the country, okay? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna give that to you all. If you want a homework assignment, there's your homework assignment. You should look into this more, because it's very, very interesting. Because it was 1.1 terabytes of data, and they didn't put any password protection on it and there was nothing to secure it. Guess where most of that data gets stored? Anybody want to take a wild guess? 
Excellent. That's funny. That's actually humorous. But no, Amazon, AWS. Notepad. Yep, Notepad. <laughs> yes, when you're storing 1.1 terabytes of data, it's best to do it in Notepad so it's easy to awk. <laughs> um, so, Amazon AWS. If you do not know what you're doing with Amazon AWS, please stop using it. Like, at least take the introduction class, like that five-minute welcome to the, the five-minute welcome to Amazon, because over the past couple of years, they've actually added security by default to much of Amazon AWS. Okay, so you go and you set up your database, and they actually try to secure it for you, and then you have to take that stuff off. You remove the security. Yeah, but anything that's been there a while was under the old regime. Yes. Which is the exact opposite, and no, they haven't gone back and fixed that. No, nobody's fixed any of their stuff. Um, when people go online, like if you go to the Bitcoin forums and they, ha they ask, like, what's the best way to mine for things like Bitcoins and stuff like that, they will tell you to just go look for somebody's Amazon AWS credentials out on GitHub and then to go get into their Amazon AWS and then to spawn as many servers as you possibly can to do all your mining on. That's sort of the recommendation nowadays if you want to be able to make money in crypto from actually mining. Use somebody else's account on Amazon AWS. Uh, which it's sort of half a joke but kind of also serious. <sighs> These companies are not doing any kind of security. They don't care. Equifax, admin, admin, who cares, no passwords, whatever, doesn't matter. They're sticking information up on the internet and they're not thinking about the fact that um, you can find this stuff. What's the program? The best, the one I, anybody know the program that I push all the time here for being able to automated find vulnerable stuff? What do I tell everybody to use? Starts with an M, mass scan. Yeah, we had a little class on mass scan. You can go in and you can set a range of IP addresses and a range of ports and you can just go look and then it will come back and tell you for every single one of those IP addresses whether or not those ports are available and it takes like five minutes. It's super fast, yes. Didn't the uh, British Secret Service also uh, publish one of their tools that does something very similar? Oh, I have no idea. Probably. I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. It's not shocking. They put it up on their GitHub account. Oh, cool. Yeah, you should send out on the Linux uh, mailing list, send out the GitHub account for British intelligence. No, they, they, they have the official one. They released it. MI6.UK. Come yeah. on. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> it's a couple terabytes of data. From That's the easy, yeah. So I have a few more things I want to go over. We're going to try to get through as much as this. I might have to jump some of this. Um, Dark Overlord. Uh, Dark Overlord was extorting Netflix. And then when they got bored with extorting Netflix, they started extorting um, high school kids because that's a step up. Um, they were stealing stuff from Netflix. And then after they were done stealing stuff from Netflix, they told them, like, I'm going to try to release your information for like Orange is the New Black or whatever that web page, that show is. They were going to put it out on the internet. Netflix said, we're not going to pay. They said, fine. They put it out. It didn't matter. It didn't really hurt anybody's profit margins, I don't think. So then they started going off with their uh, parents and kids at high schools. They grabbed a bunch of information that was leaked about parents and children that are enrolled in schools out here in the US. And they started sending bomb threats, threatening to kill the kids and then telling parents that they had to send them money if they wanted their kids to be safe. Uh, the FBI had to put out a, like a thing that said, don't give these people money. Uh, Uber. Uber got in trouble because of the fact that the bunch of information for Uber was hacked about drivers and customers. And then after hacking the drivers and customers information, Uber got in trouble for not protecting that data. And then Uber got hacked again and 57 million Uber customers' data was leaked. So Uber went to the hackers and gave them $100,000 and told them to please. That's an interesting number. Didn't we just talk about that number? Like a little bit further up? Yeah. Here's $100,000 to stay quiet. And then guess what? They still leaked the information. Oh, surprise, surprise. Shocking. 
Uh, but guess what? They paid that $100,000 during that period of time when there was a huge court case about the fact that they were having problems with privacy. Uh, so now Uber is in court while they're making a decision right now whether or not you should put CEOs and executives in jail for hiding leaks. And that's a big deal. If that goes through, that is a huge deal. Where if, not if you're breached, because breaches happen. You could get hacked, anybody can get hacked. But the idea is, is if you were a company and you get hacked, you have to tell us. You have to tell law enforcement, you have to tell your customers, you have to do something to protect them. You can't just pay out a $100,000 bill to somebody and then go, oops, when your database shows up online somewhere, okay? This is a big deal. If that goes through, that's gonna really change the face of how security breaches are handled. Yes? Uber also has a system in place that when a government or a tax authority shows up at their, one of their offices anywhere throughout the world, um, they have a hotline to a kill switch that encrypts all of the local countries drives and kills everything when they show up at, to raid their local offices like in Paris or wherever. And uh, their offices are designed to slow the investigator down so that the systems have an opportunity to get wiped or totally encrypted before the uh, subpoena can be served. Neat. I'll have to look into that. Uh, WikiLeaks, they leaked Vault 7. I archived it, did an archive IS. Uh, they've got a press release and all that information, and they have tons and tons of documents that are available. Uh, it's all very interesting. I recommend that you read it. Oftentimes, one of the problems that I see is people only read about the WikiLeaks by seeing what a news agency wrote about it. Uh, you should actually find out what's really going on. Okay, don't let somebody else filter your information. Hell, don't let me filter your information. That's why I put all these links here. Okay, because I'm telling you about this stuff, but then you should actually come here and click on this stuff and read about it. Now, I want to show you the most kick-ass, best bug report I have seen yet. Cloudflare had a situation called Cloudbleed. Did anybody hear about that? Okay, so Cloudflare had an issue, it was called Cloud Bleed, and essentially you could go in there and you could pull, pluck data from memory out of Cloudflare for a little while. These guys went in here, show you exactly how the bug was triggered, then they showed you why it happened, what they did that caused it, how it would be used by a malicious actor, and then they go in and they identify how they went to look to see if anybody was exploiting it. And they show you everything. They break the whole thing down from top to bottom. This is the best breakdown of a breach or security incident I've ever seen that was done publicly straight off their webpage and they just give it out there. This was fantastic. They've done a bunch of dumb stuff this past year, but this was awesome. I can't believe that they did this and did it so well. Um, if you have time, you should read this because if you are a security researcher, this is sort of a step-by-step -step guide to exactly how your report should be. When you're putting information out, or when you're studying any of this stuff, this right here, this is like a gold standard for exactly what you should be looking at, okay? They, I mean, they talk about their customer analytics, they go through cache data. Uh, I mean, it's fantastic. I, I can't talk it up enough. What website is that? I'm using archive.is, but it's directly off of, yeah, it's off of their blog. So I archived it because I don't want to lose it, but you can go straight to their blog if you want to, or go to my webpage and then click on Cloud Bleed and it takes you right there. A uh, bunch of political hacking happened over the year. France and Macron, DNC, uh, I've got links to all of that stuff. Essentially, it's all stuff that we've seen in the news over and over and over again, but it was important enough that we should have it on the 2017 wrap up, like, because this is gonna be the future. This is it. If you are a political candidate, or you ever plan on being a political candidate, you have no privacy. From here out forward, you will not. 
People are going to go through your emails. They're going to go through all your stuff. They're going to go through all of that because we're going to talk about here in a second. Um, the fact of the matter is the chief of police, his name's Terry Salt from Hampton, Virginia, he said, you can expect to be hacked if you have a questionable shooting. If something happens in this day and age, somebody's going to be in your system within hours. Okay? Uh, I'm going to name off some cities here. And I have no doubt if you watch the news over the past year, you're going to be able to identify what happened that ended up getting these people hacked. Baltimore, Cleveland, Madison, Wisconsin, all places where somebody either died or was shot. And within a few hours, most of these places were breached. Somebody was inside of the police department. It's unfair. Baltimore, you have too many things to choose from. So political, police, law enforcement, all that stuff, uh, if they don't step their cybersecurity game up and they don't start paying attention to this stuff, uh, they are next on the list. Like it's going to happen for all of them because for most of them it's already happened. Somebody dies, something ends up on the news, people are going to want to have that information and they're just going in and they're taking that information. And of course being a law enforcement involved person, I think that that's bad and that you shouldn't be doing that and there are reasons why. And in addition to that, people are already looking at it in terms of how do they get into this system so they can steal this data so they can use it to find out what kind of investigations are going on. There's already problems with many of these places and their cybersecurity. Money. And this is, <coughs> we're coming up to the end, but I want to go over some big money stuff. Number one, Apple just announced that they're going to bring home $350 billion that had never been taxed, and they're pledging to make 20,000 jobs, but they're doing it within five years. That's interesting. Uh, that's a huge claim, but they've got five years to do it. Isn't that coming after their Ireland thing? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, yep, it's kind of suspect. A little weird. Uh, but thank you, Apple, if, it's, if it actually happens. Like if it, if it happens and it works out and we get that money and it actually comes over here and people get 20,000 jobs and all that stuff, but everybody knows, right, it's one job per person, right? Okay. That's a joke. Thank you. Uh, if it happens, it happens and that's great. And if not, well, I don't know. And then the, the most important thing is our H1B changes. This is a huge deal. Very first thing, if you come here, I have a link that takes you to Congress. Before you do any kind of news research on this, you can go read the news as much as you want. Come to Congress, read the bill. Okay? The Congress webpage right here, you can go there and you can read the bill itself. Read the bill. This is actually what's on the table right now. There's, I've archived this, but over the past few days and through the days, things change here, okay? So you should actually go to the Congress webpage. You can use this as your guide to Google or whatever you need to do. But you should come here and start reading this. There's related bills, there's committees, there's co-sponsors. What does that mean? Those are people you can communicate with if this affects you or if this is something that you're interested in or you have comments, okay? This, all of that information is made available to you. The, the government is really getting on board with the open government thing. All the data is out there for you. You just got to understand you can use it. So what's really happening? Well, the RAISE Act is being presented. What does that mean? less abuse of the H-1B visa, which means not a whole lot for those of us who are in higher level positions. Like if we've really gotten up there past like that entry level position, probably not going to affect us that much. Because the whole idea behind the H-1B visa being that if you have an advanced job that requires an advanced person, then they can go to a foreign nation to grab that advanced person to come over here to fill that job if there's nobody available to fill it from the US. That shouldn't be for entry level IT positions, which this is changing that. Um, Congress puts in the RAISE Act. They're saying that if you have an entry level IT position, there should be no reason why you can't fill it from the many, many, many unemployed students and so on and so forth that we have that are being pushed out of colleges with a degree and no job to go into. So if you go on to places like uh, USA Jobs right now, if you go on to any of the job web pages, and if you go on to LinkedIn, 
uh, people are actually pushing right now a lot of jobs. There's a ton of stuff IT related at usajobs.com right now or whatever. They're, the USA jobs, the, the government jobs for the US, tons and tons of jobs right now. Loads of them. Um, I've been getting tons and tons of communication on things like LinkedIn of people hitting me up, asking me about filling positions and stuff like that. Uh, the, what has already happened before the RAISE Act even has gone through is essentially there is now a lot of pushback. Uh, more than 95% of H-1B visas right now, and this is coming off of the India Times, more than 95% of those H-1B visas are now being sent back for additional information. Why are you paying such a low amount to this person when they need to fill this job, which we would expect they would be paid more for? Uh, they're asking questions like, how many times did you put this job out and try to find somebody here in the US? Uh, they are pushing these back. So again, if your career is kind of already higher up, probably not going to affect you that much. But for those people who are trying to get a career started in IT or in cybersecurity or move around, uh, this is a big deal for lower. Uh, if you notice when you're looking at some of these Indian web pages, they use the word freshers. I don't really use that term, but fresher apparently means somebody who is relatively new to a career path, just so you know. Um, so they will refer to these people as freshers for new programmers and stuff like that. Yes? Yes. Uh, in addition to that, one other thing that I want you all to take a look at, because this is important as well, is if you go to Times of India or to my archive here, uh, they're already starting to list things that individuals in question need to have before they can come over here for a job. And um, it's really interesting that they're now actually asking for demonstration that you're able to accomplish the job. They want proof that you can actually do the job. They want proof of English skills now, which previously you didn't have to be able to speak English to be able to get some of these jobs. Uh, they are also um, discussing getting rid of the diversity lottery program, which essentially means that you will have to prove certain skill sets in order to be able to allow to be allowed to get a job over here, and you can't just randomly bring people over here anymore. Uh, that person has to be able to contribute. It even has a clause in there that says that you must be able to demonstrate love of country, love of the U.S. I'm not exactly sure what that is going to require. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And they don't either. But you can see inside of the comments and the discussions at, like I said, Times of India and some of these other Indian web pages, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that they're extremely worried about. But what it really boils down to is, again, mid-level management down, you're going to be finding more and more jobs that are now available specifically for U.S. citizens as opposed to those jobs being outsourced. Yes? That just rules out anybody who um, in social media made uh, critical remarks of the United States, I would think. I don't know. Nobody knows. That's the other thing. We don't know. It, it, it's flexible enough to pretty much do anything. So I've been up here talking for two hours, and I want to give you all my final recommendations. Uh, there is a cost of crime study by Accenture that was performed for 2017. I have a link to their webpage that takes you to a PDF. That PDF is pretty good. You should read it. Uh, it talks about how much money we've spent, what we're going to spend, and what kind of jobs are going to be available in cybersecurity and where people can start looking. It's very, very good. Like I said, I have a link right here. Um, in addition to that, I have a link to some of the cybersecurity figures and statistics. And essentially what it boils down to is cybersecurity crime, cybersecurity related crime is going to cost us $6 trillion every year by 2021. Okay, $6 trillion bucks, that's a lot of money. And that means more money is going to be spent on cybersecurity and people who know cybersecurity. And in addition to that, I'm still a firm believer of the whole see one, do one, teach one. So 
everybody here should be setting some goals in terms of you need to be going out and building your skills, helping other people build their skills, and then demonstrating those skills because it will help you. Getting up and talking in public, finding places that you can go talk, setting up your GitHub. Everybody here got a GitHub, right? Anybody not have a GitHub? Get a GitHub. Uh, yep, it's free. Get your GitHub. <coughs> That's right. Uh, start applying for new jobs if you want to. Exploring your options. IT jobs are back on the menu for Americans. We have tons and tons of them. USA Jobs. Go check that out right now. Uh, when you get home, look at USA Jobs. Tons of cybersecurity related jobs on there right now. Lots. Like a lot, a lot. Uh, get involved. I just said that, but I'm going to say it again. And usually the number one thing that I tell you all is use Linux for 2018. I shouldn't have to tell you. Which Linux? Probably the good one. Get, yeah, get the, right. Install Gen 2. Yes, I know who goes on G. <laughs> um, so use Linux, get involved, get your GitHub. Uh, any, any questions? No? Thank you for spending your January 2018 evening with me. Uh, I hope this has helped all of you. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, sign up with the, everybody knows about plug, obviously, so sign up on the plug mailing list, send out messages. We have lots of conversations, get mad at each other. Uh, tons and tons of stuff that's going on, and uh, thank you. Thank you all. I hope this has helped at least one of you. So have a good night. Drive home safe.